You're tuned in to Porch Talk with Rev Pat, where raw, real talk rules. So sit back and relax with that delicious cup of coffee or tea or your favorite glass of wine as Rev Pat delivers real, transparent, and raw conversations about all things life. Let's get started. Welcome, 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 welcome to another episode of Porch Talk with Rev Pat. I am so excited today because this guest today is someone that has some information that I desperately need. Has a grandma of a four-year-old autistic, newly diagnosed grandson. I need to know things that I don't know that the daycare didn't tell us or anything. So this is a podcast all about being informed in a real way, real conversation. So I'm going to introduce you to Mr. J.R. Reed, but before we all get all into that, I want you to grab your coffee, grab your tea, glass of wine, and let's get talking. So J.R., yes, I love um, that you have not weird artistic, just artistic as part of your uh, URL. And I love that. Well, you know, the, those were actually, after I got my diagnosis at age 45 and I walked out to my car in the parking lot, I actually said to, in my, to myself, huh, I'm not weird, just autistic. At age 45? Age 45. Wow. There, there, there was no diagnosis of, of autism as we know it until I was approximately 30 years old. So, wow. Yeah. Hmm. So there are a lot of people in their late 30s, and I've even heard of people up through their mid-60s, you know, that are recently getting diagnosed just because there was no autism diagnosis for us when we were kids. Yeah. Okay. Well, I thought it was, I was about to talk about how um, different we felt uh, receiving information about my four-year-old grandson, mm -hmm. but I can't even imagine at 45 having yeah. lived most of your life yeah. not knowing what was going on and probably feeling weird. Um, oh, yeah. Because there are some things that, uh, and maybe you can help me with this, that yeah. my grandson at first, before we got the diagnosis, that just really didn't uh, make sense. So it was kind of quirky. Uh, mm -hmm. We would call him kind of little quirks because he's um, very picky and yes. he has good days and bad days. Mm -hmm. uh, some, and can be as loving as he wants to be. Yep. Um, and one of the unique things about him was, although he is not nonverbal, he, um, he speaks in, I guess, gibberish, somebody would sure. say. Sure. Um, and, but the unique part was that if he's singing, he can sing the songs. He can pronounce the words. He can sing. That and is awesome. It is amazing. And he can, uh, we now have learned that it's mimicking because he can mimic the entire thing. Right. Now, the challenge came in understanding the complete switches in mood, uh, mm -hmm. the meltdowns well, that he has. So, um, can you? Funny, I, I just I just wrote an article about that last week, mm -hmm. and what I talked about was identifying what those triggers for those meltdowns are, mm -hmm. because it could be literally any literally anything out there. Now, everybody has their own unique set of triggers. I mean, for me, it's uh, very bright lights, loud noises. Uh, crowds and you know people moving around in random traffic patterns mm -hmm. for other people it's sensitivities to smell and it's not necessarily a bad smell it could be cheddar cheese they just don't like the smell of cheddar cheese or broccoli or lemon i mean yeah. it, it doesn't it doesn't have to be something it's a bad smell mm -hmm. You know, it could just be an everyday smell, or it could be, for a lot of people, it's the way their clothes feel on their body. Some people can only wear certain fabrics. 
So, I mean, it could literally be anything. So I, I think with you and in, in your situation with, you know, having your grandson recently diagnosed is you've just got to spend some time watching what happens just before that meltdown. Oh, wow. Uh, because I may get, uh, let me, let me just give you an example. Um, Friday, that was Friday. Yeah, that was Friday. He was watching one of his favorite movies and it was just about to get in. Mm-hmm. And I made the mistake of rewinding the movie because uh-huh. I wanted to go back to the song that is my favorite mm-hmm. song. And I was just going to sing it with him. No go. Mm-hmm. No go. He was expecting the ending. And my daughter looked at me and she said, he, he knows what's going to happen next. And we just changed it. And I fast forwarded, went back to the spot. But by that point, it was all over. He was done. And then he had this total meltdown. And I think that a lot of people, and for the past few months, it has been frustrating trying to explain to people uh, that he's, it, it's not just that he's acting out. It, for him, right. it's real. And that's right. it. And learning how to deal with it. Yeah, we have to learn how to deal with it. But on the other hand, I need those that are around us, like if I'm on the phone, on a call, I will let others know, you know, he's just having a bad day. And that day may be all day, or that day just may be that morning, and then he's good for the rest of the day. It it could be five minutes, and it could be 15 hours. 15 hours. So for you, how did, um, how did you, how, what made you, I'm trying to, how did it come about finally being diagnosed at 45? Did you, I mean, did you feel like an outsider? Did people feel like an outsider? Oh my goodness. Well, first, let me go back to your grandson for just a moment. Mm -hmm. So, so see, you learn something in that moment. Mm -hmm. People on the spectrum are very, very big on routine. Mm -hmm. And so his, he knows that that movie starts at point A Mm -hmm. and it ends at point Z. Mm -hmm. And if something happens in between, he's likely to get a little freaked out by that. So now you've learned, if you want to go back and listen to that song, you wait till it's over, and then you go back. Mm -hmm. So now, um, I, starting in fifth grade, my teachers would call me weird, stupid, and lazy in front of the class. What? Educators? Educators. At at Christian school, by the way. Christian school. I went to public school. Went, went to public school K through four, never got anything from my teachers. Went to Christian school five through 12 and started getting it at Christian school. Now, let me be very clear on this. All Christians are not that way. Right, true. But you get, you know, I mean, it's just like with everything else, the few bad ones taint all the good ones. Right, right. Well, so anyway. Um, I was called weird, stupid, and lazy, um, and, and that really stuck with me my entire life. And I think it, it led to some of my depression and anxiety because I you know, was just being pointed out that I was different from all the other kids, wow. and we couldn't figure out why. My parents would take me to different doctors, and they would do different tests and different things, but there was no diagnosis of autism as we know it until 92, 93, and I graduated in 84. So. So, okay, so you go from doctor to doctor. Your parents are trying to find an answer. Yeah, they're trying to figure out why I was the way I was. You know, I mean, again, being called weird, stupid, and lazy, I will will cop to being weird. But stupid (laughs) and lazy, I am not. (laughs) Stupid and lazy, I am not. So if they couldn't find an answer, did they just not do anything? It was just like, okay, you just gonna have to deal with it because we can't yeah. figure out what's, oh my God. But, but again, you gotta remember doctors didn't know either. Doctors didn't have the research available at the time to tell them what the problem was. So there's really no one to blame, you know? It just, right. it, it, it is what it is. And yeah, I felt different my whole entire life until I was 45 and finally got diagnosed. 
I, let me give you one example. I covered the Anaheim Ducks of the NHL for 13 seasons for various magazines, newspapers, websites. And, you know, a hockey game is three 20 minute periods and then there's two 50 minute breaks in between. Well, with all the noise and everything that was going on during the game, I physically had to go outside between those periods and let my brain almost reboot. I mean, just get someplace quiet, you know, and let it reboot. I, I didn't know why I, I had to do that. I just knew that I did. And I, I thought for years I was weird. And then when I finally got my diagnosis, I realized, oh, it's a sensory issue. A sensory issue, yes. 18,000 people, <laughs> loud music, and pucks bagging off the boards is just too much for me to take all in one sitting. I need to step out, reboot, and then come back in and do it again. Oh. Oh, wow. Yeah. but I, And my diagnosis at 45, it, it was an epiphany. I mean, it's like I finally, it's like the clouds parted. You know, and the sun was shining down right on me. It's like, now I've got an answer for things just like that. Now, and, and the one thing I'm learning, I don't, um, I think people like to just generally put everybody in one button. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my, just studying just a little bit that I've yeah. studied, I, I, I have come to understand that no, my grandson does not fit in any general bucket at all. No, uh, no. As he is as smart as he wants to be, there are things that he really truly enjoys doing. And then there are some things that he'll just tell you, no, it's right. not like, no, I don't want to do it. It's just, right. no, I'm not interested in that thing. Um, it, 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 as your grandson grows, I mean, I'm sure you see some of it now, but he will develop very intense interest in, in certain things. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may be, um, you know, for a younger kid, it may be playing with certain toys or, you know, whatever. I mean, for me as an adult, it's comic books, um, European soccer, um, and spending time with my dog. Yeah, it was, and, even yeah. now, I can see that he loves, I mean, love, love, love. he go, finally, they finally uh, got him in school. He's in school now. And let me tell you, when he hits that door, after he gets off that bus and he gets in this house, it's everything off. And I understand that for him, he's felt constricted or confined yeah. all day long. So his shoes, socks, everything comes out mm -hmm. off and he's outside. And he loves the outdoors. I mean, he loves the outdoors. And I'm, I don't care how cold it is. We live in Texas, so you know the weather's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Minute it's 50, next minute it's 80. I mean, when it was really cold here a couple of months ago, he was out there like he didn't even feel it. I'm like, it is freezing out here. But I mean, he no clothes, no shoes, no, no nothing. Yep. And then bring getting him to understand, no, it's too cold. Um, was a, a hassle. Let me just say, yeah. he didn't like it. He didn't like the idea. He doesn't like to have to be made to come in. Right. That's just something he enjoys doing. Now, but you know, there are things that you've got to look at with, like for example, that situation. Yes, it's really cold, and he's probably not wearing as much as he should be wearing. Is it something that's going to physically hurt him? Yeah. I mean, is, I, I, and, and I'm asking you that. Sir, I mean, for you to look at the situation. Is it too cold that he is going to, you know, his hands are going to start, you know, freezing up or, you know, something like that. If it's not, then you may want to let him do it for a little bit and then, you know, call him in and get some of it out, out of the system. Granny. <laughs> it, was, it was too cold for granny. And he, but he yeah. does. He has other things that he yeah. does. Like he uh, climbs a lot. Yes. He walks around uh, across my kitchen counter. And that freaks me out because if you call for him, you have to do it in a certain way. I had to learn this. There was a certain way to approach him. Mm -hmm. uh, or else he'll just leap. It doesn't matter. He'll just leap. He has no fear of heights, no fear of anything right. like that. And learning how to deal with that. Now, with that being said, how did you, how did your parents 
handle this all the way from your from your childhood? What were your little unique well, things that you did that that were just really unexplainable, even to yourself? And to I love to read. I mean, mm-hmm. I would come home and just open up a book. Um, I was, I tried very hard to be organized, but it was hard for me to get organized. And, you know, a lot of times I would leave my homework. I couldn't figure out where my homework was. So I didn't have my homework to to turn in, but, you know, which would bring my grades down, but then I, you know, get an A on the test. And so that would kind of balance it out a little bit. Yeah. There's a balance right there. But, you know, it's, it's things that we just have to now as an adult, I know that organization is a problem. So I am hyper-focused when I come in the house. This is where the keys go first, always. You know, at night when I go to bed, this is where I put my glasses, you know, things like that. So that I know where they are and I have to be hyper-focused on being organized. It's things like that because you, we, uh, if you don't have this diagnosis, and you hear someone say something like that, you would immediately say, well, that's, anybody can do that. Or I know a lot of people that are like that. But when you don't understand that, it's it's something that I deal with that I have no control over. Right. That's a different thing. And that's what right. I think is so, um, why we have to talk about this with family members and with friends mm-hmm. and get them to understand the norm doesn't work because that's not how their that's not how his brain works. That's right. his brain does not work like your brain. Yeah, well, you can say, well, he's just having a tantrum. No, he's not having a tantrum. No, it's tantrum to, tantrum is totally different from a meltdown. <laughs> and, and, and here's the example I use. You know, and I I raised my adult daughter from the time she was five all by myself. So when it comes to all this stuff, been there, done that. You know. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah. You go down the cereal aisle of the grocery store and the kid starts screaming that he wants a certain box of cereal. Well, just by taking him out of the cereal aisle, that's not calming down that tantrum. He'll you'll still hear him when they're three aisles over. With a meltdown, something triggers that meltdown. For example, with the movie, and you know, he's yeah. used to the thing going all the way through to the end. So when that routine stopped he just did his thing. Now, did it get better when you put it back to where it was? Okay, well, I mean, again, in younger kids, it can, you know, it may take a little bit of time, but, you know, generally, like, for example, with me, shopping malls, I I hate shopping malls. They're loud, bright lights, crowded, and people walking just all in different, different ways, and you don't know where to go. But if you took me to a shopping mall on a Tuesday morning and the lights weren't quite as bright and it wasn't quite as loud, I'd be fine. Yeah, and I read, I read that. That was one yeah. of the things I, I read about uh, uh, being very conscious about the times that he does things. Yes. Like taking him to the grocery store, go early in the morning and there's nobody there. Right. I like yeah. I said even to a restaurant, finding places that have outdoor places mm-hmm. where he can sit so that he's not um, bombarded by the sounds and the noises all at right. the same time. And right. people almost don't understand that, well, he can listen to a movie and it can be loud and he can listen to music and it's loud. But that, for him, that's not the same. It's, oh, totally it, it, it's not the same. And I, I went through that last week. I went to Albuquerque for a few days and my brother and a friend of mine and I walked into a restaurant and I got 15 feet inside the door and said, nope, we're going somewhere else. It, it was just too loud in there. Oh. I knew that all that random noise was going to affect me. Now, and you also say that part of, um, wow, is depression, anxiety, and ADHD. Mm-hmm. Yep, that was ADHD was the first thing I got diagnosed with. ADHD in college. So, in college. In college, but again, remember, and remember when we were kids, 
the kids, there was no ADHD, it was just ADD at the time. Yeah. And the only kids that got diagnosed were the kids that were, you know, crawling up the wall like Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah. You know? I used to work at an elementary school and I had, we had a little boy that thought he was a yeah. cat. I mean, in off his meds, he was crawling all over the floor. Exactly. Um, but those were the only kids that got diagnosed at the time were the very severe ones. It wasn't until mid to late 80s that they started realizing really what ADHD is and then started diagnosing people that should be diagnosed with it. So and then anxiety and depression came around in my late 20s, early 30s. A lot of it had, and I know a lot of it had to do with the being called weird, stupid, and lazy in school, feeling like I was out of place, knowing that I was different, but not knowing why I felt like I was different. Wow. So this had to affect the relationships with everyone around you. Oh, every, everybody. Here I am. I, I, the people closest to me don't understand me. I don't understand me. They're trying to figure me out. I'm trying to figure mm -hmm. me out. Yeah. How how does that work relationship wise, friendship wise, um, personal relationship, coworkers? Yeah, it, it, like across the board, like what the heck is going on? You 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 need to be honest with them, you know, and just say this is what I'm dealing with, and this is why I deal with this. And some pe people will accept it, and some people won't. I I lost. It was funny. I lost some friends over the years just because of little quirks and, and things that I had that they just couldn't deal with or didn't want to deal with. Um, once I got my official diagnosis and people heard the word autism, a lot of people freaked out. And the reason well, a lot why of people... It? It, 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 it's such a, a crazy response that you get. Because some people almost think as if it, it's, it's an immune thing. They're, they're either it's casual or right. it's shocking. Well, it, it's mm -hmm. one of the two. There, there's, there is no in between. It's e either just casual, oh, I've heard of that, or yeah. shocking, like, oh, my goodness, as if it's a death sentence and it's not. Okay. But, but, but you just said it right there. People fear what they don't understand. And if they don't understand what autism is, it's going to freak them out. But then, you know? it them out, but then you don't want to hear about it. You don't want to hear. You don't want to have an understanding of it. You don't want to. Um, and that's the frustrating part for me. You know, and, if you don't understand it, then at least leave, leave the door open for more, mm -hmm. more understanding. Don't just, or either you just hear enough of it. Um, to where I don't know I don't I don't even understand it. Uh, it's very, it's frustrating for me to try, a, to, to try to get people to understand that okay, but we're not treating him that way. Right. I want to treat him that way. But yes, we do have to be a lot more understanding in in getting him calm and getting him focused. Right. But right. no, it, 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 he's his brain just doesn't work like ours. No, and it's it differently wired. And a friend of mine uh, who, funny, she was a therapist specializing in autistic uh, teens and adults for f almost 15 years before she herself was finally diagnosed with autism. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah. A a again, as an adult in her late 30s or early 40s, she got di diagnosed. And, and her way of explaining is we're like Max in a PC world. Yeah. We have a different way of processing things, but at the end of the day, we're still going to get the job done. Right. Just in a different way. Just in a different way. Right. Um, and that is so true. Um, yeah. Now, now, I mean, with a lot of us, you know, there's instructions, you know, A, B, C, D. That may not make sense to our brains, so we may do A, C, B, D. Well, yeah. it's all still getting done. <laughs> Yeah, because now with, with my little sweetheart, uh, you can put a puzzle down in front of him and don't attempt to help him. That's not going to work. No. 
Uh, no, that that is a no no. No. But let him figure it out on his own, and he's good. Mm -hmm. uh, and he'll just if it doesn't fit, if that piece doesn't fit, that piece doesn't fit. And I've thought about it. I said, well, you know, um, if I were doing it, that's the way I would do it. I'm, right. I, I might lay everything out and then start to do it, but that's exactly what I would do. I would just keep trying pieces and keep trying pieces until it fits. Right. Now, um, did you have any kind of like uh, quirky things? Like he's very quirky about uh, um, becoming attached to certain things like silverware, spoons, forks, things like that. And, and he would just grab them and, and he doesn't want you to take them from him. It, it's just something that he may hold on for maybe an hour, 30 minutes, and then he's well, done with it. It's, it's making him feel, for whatever reason, in that moment, that fork is making him feel comfortable. Yeah. And, and I, I, I have no idea why. And you have no idea why. And if you were to ask him, I mean, you know, if he was old enough to articulate, mm -hmm. he you know, see, he was 10 years old and still doing that. You might ask him, why do you need to hang out of that fork? His answer would probably be, I, I don't know. I just do. Did you find yourself saying it to your parents a lot? I don't yeah. know what you to do. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what, the word I hate, I just cannot stand is, oh my God, I'm having one of those autistic brain fart moments, um, <laughs> potential, because mm -hmm. I heard my whole life from my parents, you're not living up to your potential. Wow. Well, they said it in, you know, a loving, nice way, like, you know, you, you, they meant you can do better than what you're doing right now, but the way my brain works is I'm very literal. I'm very factual and I take things just as they're said. So if you break that down, you're not living up to your potential. You're either succeeding or you're failing. So right. if I'm not living up to my potential, I'm failing. So what I heard was you're not good enough, but what they didn't realize, for example, with homework and school and things like that, well, you're not living up to your potential. Well, I'm trying my best and I'm failing. Therefore, I must be a failure. Well, I tell you what, one of the things uh, I admire about my daughter and my son-in-law, uh, they are really doing all that they can to Good. help him and to understand, like you said, what his triggers are. Mm -hmm. or what things bother him and um he's has a parent of a has parents of a 14 year old 17 year old four year old and three year old mm -hmm. that truly inspires me because to get to receive the diagnosis and not know what was going on and right. now I'm trying to incorporate that with everybody, including my husband mm -hmm. and myself, on one accord, I'm trying to understand what his right. triggers are, what are not his triggers, or what. And I know we've got a long way to go. I know we've got a lot of work to do. Right. But it, and and it, it will get yeah. older, or as, oh, as he gets older, it will get easier because he'll be able to. Even though you said he's speaking a little bit of gibberish right now, yeah, he will eventually, even if he's still speaking gibberish, he will find a way to let you know what things are bothering him and what things are not are not bothering him. Yeah, because my daughter is real good about um, making him show us. He started saying, "Well, show me what you want," because right. he gets frustrated about something, and he's about to to really get really seriously upset about it. Uh, the just show me, show dad, show mom, what are you trying mm -hmm. to show me? And he understands that. And he knows, right. that the, you know, I think the, it has to be frustrating for a child and I'm sure it was for you to know what you want. And for him, he can't express it. Well, it, it, it is frustrating still for me as an adult because I tried to explain something, well, just last week again, when I was with my brother for a few days, 
I was trying to explain something to him and he wasn't getting what I was trying to say, but it all made perfect sense to me in my brain. It was just a different style of communication. You know, I, what I thought was coming out of my mouth was perfectly clear, but obviously it wasn't. But obviously it wasn't. Perfectly clear. <laughs> so before we end the part one, that's, that's the interesting thing. How many siblings do you have? I have one brother who's three years younger than me. One brother, three years younger than you. Yeah. And. And then I lost my dad about 20 years ago before I was diagnosed. Um, then I've got my mom who's in her late 80s. In her late 80s. Now, the relationship with you and your brother, with him being younger um, and with you not being diagnosed, did that make an impact on your relationship with your younger brother? Your yeah, he, he did. A, there were times that he didn't want to do things with me or, I mean, three years is not that far apart in age. Not that far apart, know? no. So, you know, we would have, we had a couple of mutual friends that lived, you know, four houses down the street from us. And, you know, there were times that he wouldn't want me to hang out with him and them because he was probably afraid of what I was going to do or say, or, you know, act in a certain way. But if, as we've gotten older, it's gotten much better. So there were times when you just didn't, it was what it was. You it was something. what it was. You react to something, do something, act in a way that was totally not expected, and you had to deal with that. Yep. I can't. I, I, it just blows my mind that that you know because I always think, and I want to end it with this because in this this uh, sure. part part one because let me tell you what it made me think about. Now it made mm -hmm. me rethink a lot of things. Because I'm one of those, um, I guess, let's do everything decently in order and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of a strict mom, but not really. My daughter said I was, but I don't think I was. Right. But I'm one of those, I, was, I felt so convicted after learning of his diagnosis. Right. About the times that I probably heard a, a child spazzing out. And the mom trying to get that, that baby calm or whatever. And I got this, and I had this smart aleck response. Like, I would tear that kid up or something like that. I'm just being honest. I'm talking Never, about being I, 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 I am right there with you on that. I'm being authentic because I don't, and after having experienced it, I really had to say, Lord, forgive me. Because that right. may have been a parent that was dealing with a child that is just like my grandson. Right. And didn't have the words or the time to say, hey, look, because you're not going to just go up and go, well, hey, look, I'm sorry, my kid is autistic, whatever. I'm not going to, we're not, they're not going to wear no. it. The parent is going to label their child and just throw it out there. But we as a society, need to rethink these things and become more educated because mm -hmm. I'm one of those guilty ones that had that response. That kid is screaming and yelling and they need to get that kid out of here. They ought to make, take them to the car, get them out of here, whatever. Right. Well, right. right. Three to four and, months. And, um, and, I, I, and I'll tell you that even, even now, being diagnosed for almost 11 years, I still, every once in a while, if I'm in a store, have that where my first reaction is, what's wrong with that parent? Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. The kid might be autistic or he might be bipolar or he might be, you know, ADHD. There might, there's probably something with the child that's triggering it. And it's not just the kid. Bad kid. It's not yeah. just a bad, spoiled kid. Right. right. And, I mean, and I, I want to end on that note for this section because... I mean, if my, my prayer is that if you know someone who has a child mm -hmm. or a grandchild or a niece or a nephew that has been given this diagnosis, first don't lump them in a category because all of them are not, all these kids are not the same. My no. grandson is somewhat verbal, but I also have 
God has blessed me to meet people that have kids, grandsons and nieces and nephews who are, who are nonverbal right. at all. Um, yes, he passes out, but he's not having a tantrum. Yes. He's having a meltdown. There's something going on and something has triggered it. Yep. And if you don't understand it, would you lovingly have an open mind to allowing us to explain it without mm -hmm. the judgment or without anything else attached to it, which is what I would assume that as these babies get older, as you yourself and the parents and the family members would greatly appreciate because we don't, I don't want my grandson treated differently if we go somewhere. Right. Or we're out and about, even though I right. know that there are certain situations I'm not going to put him in. Right. Oh, uh, we're learning that there are certain things we're not just going to subject them to. But the the comments or the looks, if if people only understood, if you took one second to maybe think to yourself, maybe their baby is autistic. Or maybe that baby, like you said, is bipolar or something. Yeah. And it's right. not just a spoiled brand. And my God, how many parents have we made feel guilty when they didn't know? If you're talking about 19, you said 1993? Uh, 92, 93 is when they started. 93 before this even, uh, they even well, there was any But that's when it was first being diagnosed. It didn't get right, like, mainstream diagnosed until probably 95. Yeah. And, you know, of, it, it, and, 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 you know, we really ignore things unless it's somebody famous who, mm -hmm. who has to deal with it or has a, has a child. Right. Is, uh, because all of a sudden, you know, uh, oh, so-and-so son is, or I heard so-and-so son is, but you have everyday every day working folk dealing with this and they mm -hmm. don't have the resources that those people have nope we don't nope. i mean we don't we don't have the resources that those people have we don't have the resources to come and let a speech pathologist or something right. come in the house and right. work with him right. so we have to be very cognizant of um making sure that when we're talking to family and friends and others that we are very clear that this is a real thing. And I know we love to cancel stuff out nowadays. We love to say, oh, that's not, that's just what they say. No, no. I tell you what, come spend a week in mm -hmm. my shoes and mm -hmm. you'll change your mind. So with that, I'm going to end um, this part one of my conversation with J.R. Reed, all about understanding autism, what is, what is autism, and some of the other things that are attached to autism. Um, JR was not diagnosed until he was 45 years old. Um, and my heart goes out to him and his family. So we, I want to pick up the second half. And I really want you to talk about autism. Um, I will. I think we did it in reverse so that we can educate, okay. educate some people. So I'm going to thank you all for uh, joining me on this episode of Porch Talk. And we're going to come right back with part two with jr can i say one thing on this part before we go real quick yes you can you know it's it's important for people to you know for autism awareness but it's also more important for autism acceptance oh because i'm aware of i mean i'm aware of hitler and what he did but i don't accept it i'm aware of racism but i don't accept it Right. You know, so it, it's great for people to be aware, but once they're aware, then they have to accept that, hey, this is reality. This is the way it is. Wow. That is the perfect end to this episode. It's one thing to be aware. Wow. It's another to accept it as a reality in the right. lives of others. So right. thank you for joining me for this part one. JR, I'm going to pause and then I'm going to come right back and we're going to pick up with part two.